Nice. Yeah. Nice. Your executive committee is in full force here, so Mr. Chairman, you could get a roll and start, and I think we'll hit uh, quorum by the time we do the roll. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you there, Mr. Executive Director, and thanks all for her here. Good afternoon, everyone. This is your COG Board Chair, Derek Davis, and I'd like to call the July COG Board meeting to order. Thank you for joining us uh, virtually for today's meeting. Recognizing this, that this is a virtual platform, we request your patience with any glitches that may arise. Uh, please make sure your microphones are muted. Let me say that again. Please make sure your microphones are muted. Uh, and if in fact we are, it is necessary, I believe as Jenny will help us make sure that microphones are muted so that we don't have any interference uh, from background noise that comes to uh, the things that are being said in the meeting. If you would like to speak, please make sure you to unmute your line and then return back to mute after speaking. First, I'd like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and then I will cover some virtual meeting logistics. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, on with the meeting. After my initial remarks, Sharon Pandic, who has been monitoring the participants, will take a roll call of members or alternates to document your presence at this meeting. Please remember to state your name and jurisdiction. Again, when you speak, please remember to state your name and jurisdiction. Our webinars, audio and video are being live streamed on the COG website through COG's YouTube account. To facilitate questions, comments for our speakers as smoothly as possible during the meeting, there are two options. The first is to write in the WebEx chat function your name and that you have a question. After I facilitate those questions, I will then verbally call for any last questions from each state and the District of Columbia. This is a good moment for those who are on the phone only to ask. So again, first we facilitate the questions that come from the WebEx chat function. Then I will ask verbally for last questions from each state and the District of Columbia. And at this point, anyone who's on the phone, this is a good place for you to ask your question. During votes, after a motion to adopt, a resolution is made and seconded, we will proceed to discussion. After discussion, I'll ask for abstentions or nay votes. I ask that you state your name and jurisdiction as you state your vote. Again, I'm only asking for abstentions and nay votes. The rest I will take as a yes vote. A reminder to read along via the electronic board packet with the link sent out by email and posted on the COG website. Uh, go to your email function and look for Pat Warren's name and you will find the litany of documents that you need to, to find. And I'm certain you have more than one web device or one mo mobile device that you're using. You post it up like I have on there. If you have any IT questions during the meeting, please call our friend Pat. Pat Warren, that is, I should say, not all know our friend Pat by our friend Pat, but Pat Warren is the person that you should call with regard to IT questions. Okay, Sharon, please take the role of who is present for today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll start off with the District of Columbia. I have Mr. White. Is there anyone else from the District of Columbia? Going to the state of Maryland, I have Mr. Adams, Mr. O'Connor, Mr. Dennis, Mr. Moe, Mr. Hunter, Ms. Navarro, Mr. Davis, Ms. Newton, Ms. Stewart. 
Is there anyone else from the state of Maryland? Going to the Commonwealth of Virginia, I have Mr. Wilson, Mr. Dorsey, Ms. Brisbane, Mr. Sendejas, Ms. Wheeler, Ms. Bailey, and Mr. Parker. Anyone else from the Commonwealth of Virginia? Mr. Chairman. Dave Snyder, City of Falls Church. Uh, Dave Snyder, City of Falls Church on the phone. Well, Mr. Snyder now gives you a quorum, Mr. Chairman. Hey, thank you, Mr. Snyder. You are a gentleman and a scholar and a quorum maker. We appreciate it. Thank you. I move we adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I love the way you think. <laughs> so let me let me briefly set uh set the, the, the agenda for today. Uh, and then we'll move into item number three, the, the executive um, director's report. But today we will be hearing from Nash, a national expert with some data about the disparate impacts that COVID-19 has had, particularly along racial and ethnic lines. That'll be in agenda item number eight. In fact, today's entire board meeting is themed around racial equity as we as policymakers share with each other that we're in line item nine in a racial equity exchange. What we're doing together to learn uh, from COG, we'll do that in line item 10, and then we'll take up the resolution in line item number 11 to explicitly affirm that equity and anti-racism are fundamental values of our work here together as the COG board. So uh, as we look at our agenda, you, you understand in summary, that is the approach that today is about racial equity exchange and is about anti-racism as a fundamental value of our work here together. And with that, now I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Bean to give us his updates for the executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Beverly Perry from Washington, D.C. has joined. Thank you, Ms. Perry. We have duly noted, Ms. Pandy. And Gail Roper from Montgomery County. Thank you, Ms. Roper. Mr. Bean, floor. Thank you. Uh, three things today. Uh, first on COVID-19 uh, coronation, um, COG has forged agreement among Officials have begun testing a regional hospital capacity dashboard, and this provides public health agencies and hospitals with information about the medical search status of hospitals in the metropolitan region. Second, in the past month, uh, staff have been engaging representatives from the three state departments of health regarding how to facilitate sharing of data as it pertains to contact tracing. And uh, third, in addition, COG's website now features uh, a page of public available health data dashboards by member governments, as well as with links to local school reopening plans for fall 2020. So the dashboards that are available, we've incorporated them in an app uh, on the page and the website page is mwcog.org slash COVID-19. Uh, next, in our complex multi-jurisdictional region, mutual aid among local, state, and federal public safety agencies is critical to share resources across borders to respond to emergencies. Um, mutual aid, in a sense, is the surge capacity that uh, uh, all the jurisdictions need. Mutual aid is not automatic aid. It is uh, voluntary. Uh, next, um, the framework uh, through which the mutual aid is uh, is made operational is called the mutual aid operations operations plan. And at the beginning of the year, talks began a review of the mutual aid operations plan to de 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 determine if the plan needed update or amendment, where this work was delayed due to COVID-19. That said, uh, the events of June 1, specifically the policing activity. Uh, in Lafayette Square and the resulting concern from these misuse of officers led members to call for a review of the MAOP, which COG has now undertaken with a work group of our police chief committees and the awareness of the CAOs. 
The goal of this review is to ensure the plan accurately addresses the interests and policing protocols of the jurisdictions of the region. Happy to answer questions here or board members may contact me at your convenience with interest in this area. The next is moving beyond the immediate and the operational. Um, Mr. Chairman, what I'm thinking is bringing over the next few months uh, a focus on beyond the pandemic and even beyond a widely available vaccine. I call this in the year 2022. And the, the notion is uh, what disruptions from 2020 that we're experiencing now will persist into 2022. And some of the key factors I think that we need to be looking at are, are of course, telework. Um, telework is going to increase, but how much? Um, we could get some more data, some more projections on the implications of the disruptions now and what will persist, persist in the future. Transit, um, when will it return and at what level? Um, if there are other modes that are being taken, will those persist or not beyond the pandemic? Uh, amenities, uh, retail, um, some have called this the great acceleration uh, with maybe only a few uh, major retail, Amazon, et cetera, left standing. What will that mean? Restaurants, uh, we look at the larger trends. It's only in 2015 when uh, spending at restaurants in the country began to exceed spending at grocery stores. Of course, that has flipped backwards in the last few months, but uh, what will that mean in post pandemic? Then finally, city suburb flows. What will the, the core, how will the core be different? How will suburbs be different? Um, I'm not sure that anyone has these answers, but I think over the next year, it's up to us to be asking, asking these questions. So as a long range planning organization, where economy, transportation and housing meet, um, I think the, the first takeaway is that cities and metros will be the first to recover. Um, I think looking at disruptions that have happened in the past, to look at the economic recovery, this is where the dynamism is. Uh, this is where the, I think the term is aggl agglomeration effect of having uh, uh, innovation um, through, through uh, proximity. So um, one observer is the Nobel Prize winner in economics 2018, that's Paul Romer. He says the underlying economic reality is that there's tremendous economic value in interacting with people and sharing ideas. Of course, the question will be interacting and sharing ideas in person or what, what will be the disruption of this virtual environment. But he says, for the rest of my life, cities are going to be where the action is. Uh, another that, that I'm reading that I would commend to the board is Richard Florida. And Richard Florida spoke to the COG board maybe 15 years ago. He was one of the predictors of the rise of cities in his uh, 2002 book, The Rise of the uh, Creative Class. And he has a three-part series in City Lab, which has been acquired by Bloomberg. Um, June 19th, it was an article, this is not the end of cities. June 25th, the lasting normal for the post-pandemic city. And then July 2nd, the forces that will reshape America's cities. So, it's dense with content. Uh, I'll be happy to share the link with the board if you if you can't immediately find it. But just one nugget out of there is a, is a focus on density. Um, and uh, Richard Florida and other observers are, are saying it's not density per se, but overcrowding that has driven the spread of the of the virus. So New York City has probably been the most studied in this respect. And the conclusion of the NYU and others is that COVID-19 has not been a problem of population per square mile, but one of square feet of the number of people per unit of housing. So it's not density on a city block, but it's density within a particular unit. Um, the New York City Department of Health notes that the densest blocks uh, are in Manhattan, but the greater number of cases and deaths have been in Queens and, and, and Brooklyn. So um, my takeaway from this read is density is okay. Overcrowding is a problem that we need to be need to be working on. So there's a lot there, Mr. Mr. Chairman, but I uh, hope to engage the board, our staff, your planning directors, and uh, what disruptions from 2020 will persist into 2022, 2023. 
So, Mr. Chairman, happy to answer questions about these topics or other other COG matters. Sure. Yeah. To, to, to look at the links, to look at the links that um, Chuck ha has discussed, I, I've had a good time between tax questions, uh, uh, looking at the big picture. Uh, there was a question from uh, Commissioner Br Briskman from out in Loudoun County. Um, Ms. Briskman, you have a question? Yes, thank you so much. And uh, it's great to see everybody. Unfortunately, I missed last month. So, hi, yeah, missed you. everybody. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Bean, on the mutual aid operations review, will that um, include uh, uh, mutual oper emergency operations response on the river, um, particularly because we had a tragic, tragic yeah. drowning on the river, um, gosh, probably about a month ago, and the 911 calls were just a stab to the heart, painful to listen to. And our emergency operations folks did mention that mutual response plan uh, when we were reviewing those calls. And so I was just wondering if this might be an opportunity to review those. Uh, I'm not certain of that particular incident, but I can certainly commend that to staff to share that with the committee for their, their consideration. Yeah, I mean, we can talk offline a little bit about it, and, and I would actually love it if um, your staff could maybe give me a briefing at some point on, on how that works along the river, the emergency response. Thank, thank, thank you. We'll be happy to, happy to follow up. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Riskman. And yeah, that, that's been a, a point of discussion for, for all of us, and we're learning more and more about how that works. And so I, I'd encourage uh, those who, who need to understand to, to reach out to staff offline and make sure that they're clear about that and how it works. Let me turn to Vice Chair White. Uh, thank you very much. And, and Chuck, thanks uh, so much for the, uh, for the report. Uh, also on the, uh, the, 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 the mutual aid uh, sort of uh, assistance between agreement between our police forces, uh, which has worked well, obviously, in many instances uh, sorry for the baby background voice. Um, you know, historically, the Park Police have been a good partner here in D.C. Uh, obviously, I have some serious concerns about the actions um, near Farragut Square uh, around uh, President Trump's photo uh, near St. John's Church. Uh, the, the, the actions that are now being scrutinized by Congress, by the Park Police, uh, make me wonder if we need to start to... Um, look at parameters on this agreement or you know or or really uh start to have conversations about uh whether we're going to have to reevaluate this at, at some point because they do answer to the executive uh who i think is in a different place than a lot of the region so so that's a concern i don't know what the answer is and i don't know if you have uh, thoughts on that yeah i would uh say generally the the provision of mutual aid by a responding jurisdiction is voluntary and looking at the terms of that response and how that operation is carried out, I think would be part of the MAOP review. So I think uh, the, the spirit and the content of your question, I think, is part of the review. Perfect. Perfect. Thank, thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, Ms. Briskman. Um, let me continue on. Again, I encourage all who, who, who seek uh, for further information or edification with regard to, to definitely uh, speak with staff offline with regard to that issue. This is one that the executive committee had, had um, a brief discussion about last week and, and, and our staff is prepared. So these are very important agreements for this region and, and to the extent that we as uh, local legislators uh, can work collaboratively to make them better, we must. And to the extent that we can hold all parties accountable, we must. So let me move on to item number four, which is amendments to the agenda. Let me ask, are there any amendments to the agenda? And hearing none, we'll move on to the next item, which is agenda item number five, which is approval of uh, minutes from June 10, 2020. Is there a motion and a second to approve the minutes from June 10 board meeting? Honey Gross uh, moves to approve. There's a motion. Second from Prince William. Thank you. There's been a motion, appropriate motion, and, a, and an appropriate second that has been um, documented by the clerk. Are there any abstentions or nay votes? 
Hearing none, the motion passes. Let me continue on to agenda item number six, which is our consent agenda. We have two resolutions on the consent agenda today. Resolution 23-2020, authorizing COG to receive and expand grant and expend grant funds from the Federal Transit Administration for its innovative coordinated access and mobility pilot program and resolution 24, 2020, authorizing COG to procure and enter into a contract to complete a regional analysis of the impediments to fair housing choice. Is there a motion and second to approve the consent agenda items? Penny Gross uh, moves to adopt the consent agenda. Nancy Navarro seconds. Thank you. There's a motion, an appropriate second that's been documented. Are there any abstentions or nay votes? And hearing none, the motion passes. That gets us to agenda item number seven, and this is the allocation of additional federal funds to support housing stability. As you are all aware, Congress passed the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security CARES Act to provide assistance to state and local governments to combat the epidemic uh, and provide economic relief to our residents and businesses. However, after discussion with the executive committee, we believe the bill does not provide adequate or appropriate funding to ensure housing stability for those who are facing an increased risk of evic evictions and homelessness due to the recession caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. We recognize that housing is a fundamental is fundamental in helping shape a more equitable future. In January, COG's annual count of persons experiencing homelessness resulted in the lowest number ever recorded since the enumeration began in 2001. To sustain such progress, action to protect housing security must be taken. Is there a motion and a second to adopt resolution 25-2020 supporting the allocation of additional federal funds to support housing stability and sending an accompanying letter to leadership in the House and Senate. Supervisor Briskman from Loudoun, so moves. Second, Supervisor Briskman County. There has been an appropriate motion and a, a, a second that's been documented by the clerk. Uh, so now I'll facilitate discussion questions from board members. Let me see, Chuck. Any, do you see any in the, in the um, hopper? My, my cell phone went dark on me. Here no, we go. No, no questions. All right. Um, okay. So we have no questions. Let me just check to make sure from board members from Maryland. Let me make sure that there are no questions from board members from Virginia. Any questions from board members from the District of Columbia? All right, let me now move to the vote. Are there any abstentions or nay votes? Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you. Let's move on to agenda item number COVID-19 equity implications. Turning to the agenda item, uh, we find uh, the board will hear from Tia Taylor Williams the Director of Health and Education at the American Public Health Association Centers for Public Health Policy and School. Uh, Ms. Taylor Williams, are you on board? And I see your PowerPoint. I don't see your face yet, though. Is Ms. Taylor? I am here. All right. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, there you okay. are. Good to see you. Hi. Great, thank you so much for this opportunity, Jenny. Thank you for inviting me and hello to everyone. Um, I don't think I've met many of you before, so I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, as um, mentioned, I am with the American Public Health Association. We are an, a membership organization for professionals working in public health. While we are headquartered in Washington, D.C., we are national in scope. Um, however, we do have 53 state and regional 
public health associations that um, carry out the work of public health advocacy at the state and local level. And please let me know if, if at any point my sound quality gets muffled. Um, so thank you for inviting me here to talk about COVID-19 um, and the intersections with racism and more broadly racism as a public health issue. Uh, next slide. So just uh, a review of kind of where we are within the pandemic. Um, we are just under 3 million confirmed COVID-19 cases with about 125,000 deaths in the US. Um, we know that populations with underlying health conditions are experiencing higher rates of mortality. And we know these same chronic conditions have plagued low income and communities of color at alarmingly high rates for decades. So in many ways, the pandemic has exposed uh, the pre existing inequities in access opportunities and outcomes that existed prior to the pandemic. Next slide. Few regional numbers. Um, well, first I'll go with nationally. Um, the COVID-19 mortality rate for Black Americans is two times higher than the rate for Latinos, 2.3 times higher than the rate for Asians, and 2.6 times higher than the rate for whites. Um, and this chart also shows some regional numbers where that trend also plays out. Um, the most alarming being in DC, where Black Americans represent 46% of the population and nearly three quarters of COVID-19 deaths. And it's important to note that as of um, Monday, um, or actually Sunday, 83% uh, of the DC deaths were in Ward 6, 7, and 8. Um, for Hispanic and Latinos, um, a similar trend of the COVID-19 death rates being a few percentage points higher than their actual percentage of representation within the population. Um, and the numbers within this region follow that trend. But if you look at other parts of the country, the COVID-19 death rates um, for Hispanics and Latinos are much higher. Next slide. So these, the, that chart shows some striking health disparities. Um, and we know that these disparities are the result of centuries of oppression and decades of intentional disinvestment in communities, um, a lack of access to basic services, including living wage, affordable quality housing, education, and health care are all systemic challenges that are fueled by racism. The pandemic and underscores that in order to achieve health equity, we have to prioritize racial equity. But before we go deeper into exploring how racism is operating within the pandemic, I'd like to offer a definition of racism and explore the levels at which it operates. Next slide. So there are many defin definitions of racism, and one we have adopted at APHA is that of Dr. Kamara Jones, um, past APHA president, um, PD, a family physician and scholar. And she defines racism as a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how a person looks, i.e. race. And the result is a system that unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, unfairly advantage, advantages other individuals and communities, and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. So when we think about inequities within our school systems and the lack of investments in young people of color, um, and the over-policing, arresting, and incarcerating of Black and Latinx boys, that's what we're talking about when we refer to sapping the strength of of the society through the waste of human resources. Next slide. It's important to recognize that racism operates on several different levels and you will hear this framed in different ways, but um, this is a framing that Dr. Kamar Jones has coined and that we've adopted. Um, at the institutional level, racism is defined as differential access to goods, services, and opportunities by race. It's structural and codified in our institutions, practices, policies, and customs. Personally mediated or interpersonal racism is defined as 
prejudice and discrimination, where prejudice is differential assumptions and discrimination is differential actions toward others according to their race. Um, these actions may be intentional as well as unintentional, and it includes acts of both commission and omission. So when you think about um, color blindness or people saying that it, that they don't see race, that can be considered an act of omission. And this personally mediated level is what most people think about when they think about race um, or when they think about racism. Um, and this is also what hinders us from having honest and hard conversations about racism because no one wants to be labeled as racist. Um, lastly, uh, internalized racism is defined as the acceptance of members of a stigmatized group of the negative messages around their own abilities and intrinsic worth. It's characterized by their not believing in others who look like them and not believing in themselves. Next slide. So when we ask the question of how racism is operating within the COVID-19 pandemic, we can examine it and how it plays out at the different levels. So at the institutional level, racism influences who can practice prevention measures. We know in absence of a vaccine, there's a few things that we can do, um, but our ability to do those things is influenced by larger structural factors. So hand washing, so in addition to soap, you need indoor plumbing, running water and safe water. Um, but a 2019 report found that 2 million Americans lack access to safe drinking water and basic sanitation. Compared to white households, Black American and Latinx households are nearly twice as likely to lack complete pump plumbing. And Native American households are, are 19 times more likely to lack basic sanitation and indoor plumbing. And then you also have to think about communities like Flint and many more who have been fighting for years for access to clean water. Institutional racism influences who can practice physical distancing and sheltering in place. People of color are more likely to be working in low wage essential jobs with inadequate personal protective equipment, putting them at greater risk of exposure to COVID-19. These essential workers are also more likely to rely on public transit to get to and from their places of employment. And then there's the issues of living in denser populated metro areas, which I think we're, we were just discussing, multifamily housing and other environmental factors that increase exposure to the virus. We also can look at who has access to health care and testing and treatment. Um, Black, Black and Latinx communities are overly represented among the underinsured or the uninsured. And we've seen that within the pandemic, particularly earlier in the pandemic, screening and testing were happening more frequently in predominantly white and higher income neighborhoods. Next slide. At the personally mediated or interpersonal level, racism influences how we look at, or how we think about who gets the virus. So thinking about the labeling and the disparaging names that have been used to label the virus and the resulting discrimination against Asians and Asian, Amer Asian Americans. Um, our initial travel restrictions focus mostly on travel from Asian countries when we found out um, that many um, of the transmissions, particularly in the New York City area, were coming from uh, your people traveling from Europe. So missing an opportunity there like to um, halt the transmission. What? I'm sorry. OK. Um, and it also influences who gets tested and treated. Um, a, a review of billing information found that Black Americans with symptoms like cough and fever were less likely to be given one of the coronavirus tests earlier in the pandemic. And I think that's still occurring, even with more widely available testing. And still early screening and testing was happening more in predominantly white and higher income areas. Next slide. This slide just briefly shows a poll, the results of a poll by the Pew Research Center that found that many Black and Asian Americans have experienced discrimination due to their race or ethnicity due, due, uh, since the pandemic. Next slide. At the internalized level, it, uh, it can show up as shaming and blaming Black Americans for their pre-existing conditions. I've had, you know, I've seen things like this on social media, have had similar conversations even within my own circles and my own family about if we just ate right and exercised, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't have the outcomes that we have. 
And while good nutrition and exercise are important for health, we know they are also shaped by larger structural forces that are outside of many individuals' control. Um, it could also look like delaying or avoiding seeking health care, but I have to note that this is also largely influenced by structural and interpersonal racism. So, you know, the lack of insurance or fears about medical bills or past experience with the health care system can also uh, prevent people from seeking care. But there is also an, an internalized devaluing of intrinsic worth that may be at play and cause people not to seek care. The ultimate result is preventable morbidity and mortality. Next slide. So at a time where family resources are dwindling and being spread even thinner, we have to avoid finger pointing and placing the blame on the behaviors of individuals in marginalized communities. We know that racism is a driving force for the social, economic, and environmental conditions that influence health. So just on this slide is, uh, are some examples of the reframing that we've done to highlight the systemic and structural issues that influence disparate outcomes within and outside of the pandemic. Next slide. With Black, Latinx, and Native communities more likely to become infected with COVID-19, because they are more exposed and less protected, and once they are exposed, they're more likely to die due to higher burdens of chronic disease and less access to health care. When I gave this talk back in April and May, I spoke about the pandemic being a crisis within a crisis for communities of color and the possibility of a co-occurring crisis. And at the time, I was referring to extreme weather events related to climate change. And then the uprising happened after many racially motivated acts and killings, including the murder of George, George Floyd, lifted the veil on the insidious ways in which racism and white supremacy culture have permeated our systems and communities. So we can no longer dance around these issues. Still, climate change is a very real and imminent threat. As the, water, as the weather warms up and the effects of climate change are more present, um, the, risk the risk increases of heat-related deaths, extreme weather events, and possible vector-borne illnesses. And it's no surprise that the most climate-sensitive communities are also communities of color. So racism, whether it's institutional, interpersonal, or environmental, is the root cause of many inequities. Next slide which is why it's so important that around the country, uh, state and local leaders are declaring racism as a public health emergency or crisis. While in many cases, the impetus for these declarations is the uprising over police violence and the movement for Black lives, recognizing racism as a driving force for inequities across uh, all outcomes for individuals and communities allows us to begin to address the issue more holistically. So APHA has begun tracking these declarations, which are primarily being driven at the local level. Um, and this is a growing list. Every day we're getting more emails about, um, about states and localities that are doing this. Um, so about uh, 60, 62 localities across 16 states. Um, locally, that includes both Montgomery and Anne Arundel counties. And if there's any that I miss, please let me know and we will get those added um, from the regional area. Um, and these declarations range from more symbolic to really comprehensive with strategic actions um, that almost all of them include some effort to collect data and to collect and publish data on inequities, um, some establish equity task forces, and others go far further to actually allocate funding or redirect funding um, to support their racial equity efforts. For example, um, Boston will redirect 12 million from police overtime funds to equity and inclusion efforts. So these uh, declarations are an important first, first step and have to be followed by strategic action. Next slide. Um, so before I wrap up, I just wanted to provide a framework that can be used 
within our organizations. Um, it can be applied to our work with communities. It can be applied to um, philanthropic and grant making efforts for how to assess kind of where you are um, in terms of being an active anti-racist or advancing racial equity organization. Um, the first is to name and be explicit about naming racism as a driving force of the inequities and disparities and outcomes. And the next is to ask, how is racism operating? So you want to look at structures, the who, what, when, and where of decision making um, for an organization that could look that could look like the uh, look at the composition of your board, your senior leadership or managers, whoever's in a leadership position. You want to look at policies, the written how. Is there an alignment of your organizational policy, uh, policies and your stated values and missions? Are there inherent biases within policies for, um, you know, things like dress code and things around, you know, how hair can be worn come to mind? Um, those are the most apparent ones, but there's more that are more embedded and more insidious. Is there transparency about how policies are made and enforced? Um, looking at your practices and norms, that's the unwritten how. Who's leading your anti-racism or racial equity efforts within your organization? Oftentimes, it's a small group of people of color that are, are carrying the burden and leading the way. Um, is the practice of anti-racism or racial equity ongoing and embedded across the organization? Or do you do a one-off training and just check something off your list? Um, is there a system for accountability? Um, also looking at the values, and that's the why. Is there a hierarchy of valuation by race or ethnicity, by work role, by education level or discipline within your organization? And once you have, once you start to do this assessment, which can also be done, as I said, um, with programmatic activities, um, you can start to allocate resources, develop structures and systems and addressing um, for addressing and systems for accountability. Um, so I'll just skip forward to the next two slides. Um, APHA, if you could go to the slide on advancing racial equity, Jenny. APHA has launched a webinar series on advancing racial equity. It's available at that link. Um, you can easily get to it on our site, APHA.org. Um, we will continue to focus on that series um, and expand it, and all the recording and slides are available. Um, if you can move to the next slide, we also have a number of webinars specific to the COVID-19 pandemic, and those are available at COVID-19conversations.org. Uh, next slide. So I want to thank you all so much for this opportunity. Here's some additional resources, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Taylor Williams. That was excellent. Um, let me turn to board members to facilitate a Q and A. Uh, let me see first if I'm looking on the chat. Chuck, do you see any questions on the chat? I do not see questions on chat. Okay. Um, let me, as as colleagues uh, line up for questions, um, let me just ask uh, Miss Miss Taylor what, what the first the first part is in your data element. Do you have any uh, data elements that are broken down any further? Uh, than than the broad state level data, and I saw the District of Columbia. I was wondering if you've been tracking specifically in in, in Maryland and Virginia the jurisdictions um, like Prince George's County that has a large African American, large uh, Latinx uh, community, and in Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. I, my organization has not been tracking that at down at that level as i said we're national in nature but it's very easily accessible through the COVID 19 dashboard from each of the county at, at the state level okay um looking forward looking forward to 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 that if in fact you, your your organization uh, does decide if, if we could continue that dialogue off offline maybe we'll, we'll look at that i see uh, my vice chair dorsey has a question Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Ms. Taylor Williams. I really appreciate the presentation. Uh, and as much as uh, I understand why we, we focus on uh, COVID deaths and the disparities there, they are final, they are tragic, they are overwhelming. Uh, you know, that, that notwithstanding, there are people who survive COVID and the disparities that exist among them are, are quite as pronounced as well. And as we're learning more about this virus and the lingering uh, health effects 
works. When you consider uh, people who are surviving COVID, but who do so in a world where their underlying health dis conditions, disparities, there are all of the institutional and environmental factors that you talked about, the access to care issues. The, the, the question that comes to me is, what do you recommend we think about in terms of what might be the tail of this as we move yeah. forward, as COVID contributes to increased morbidity uh, for people who actually survived the initial infection? Yeah, that I think that is a, a an excellent question and something we really need to think about how to start collecting that data. I think we're just starting to have conversations now about the increase in morbidity just for people who delayed seeking care for non-COVID um, reasons because you know all of the attention was on COVID elective elective procedures were canceled. And I think we are going to see um, an increase in morbidity and maybe even mortality as a result of, of that delay. And I think we need to try to think about what kind of systems we can put in place to capture that data. But it's all, um, you know, it the pandemic just underscores that we really need to elevate improving those environmental factors. There are a number in, in, in addressing those social needs that existed well be, before the pandemic and they will exist beyond. Um, so I, I'm open to having conversations about how APHA can be a part of that conversation, but we are looking at, um, you know, now that things are starting to reopen and may, you know, close again. Um, how do we put systems in place to really track um, the excess morbidity that has happened as a result of the virus, but also just the delay in, in healthcare because every all the resources have been diverted towards the virus. So I don't have an answer, but I'm open to exploring what how we might um, how we might begin to address that issue or e even capture it. And thank you. And I think at the very least, just making sure people are focused on that. I know so many people mm -hmm. focused on the COVID end game, but realizing yeah. that yeah. there is no real end game. This is going to have a long tail. Sounding that alarm will be important. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Chair Dorsey. That, that was critical to this discussion as we move forward. Let me turn to Commissioner Briskman. Uh, she had a question as well. Yes, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, in our COVID update last night, uh, we learned that one zip code in, in my county has a third of the COVID cases, and it is the zip code that has the majority, has the majority of our Latinx community. Um, the morbidity rate in that community actually is is low. I mean, every, every death is a surprisingly the morbidity rate was quite low. Um, I would love to have some examples. I, I hope we're get, get, going to get your PowerPoint because the link with examples of how jurisdictions have declared racism a public health crisis. Um, I would love examples of that. And I just saw the city of Frederick's going to do it on July 16th. So um, I would love to have some examples on how to do that because if we could do that in Loudoun County, then some of the ideas that I have, for example, using hotels that are empty to help our communities of color separate, for example, um, when there's an infection in the home because they can't separate. They have, you know, a large number of family members in one home. So, you know, that would help solve some of the issues. But I would love to be able to bring that initiative to, to my board so um, people could send me examples or I'd love to see your uh, PowerPoint with the link in it. Yeah. Yeah, we have the links to all of them on that um, on the and you will get I believe Jenny, they will get the PowerPoint, but if not, um, feel free to shoot me an email. I can send you that link and APHA is also working. We're looking at all the different elements of we're looking across the different declarations and identifying key elements to see if we can provide some guidance for states and localities that are looking to to introduce their own or create their own declaration. So some key things that that needs to include. But to your point about um, using unused spaces uh, for isolation, that is happening in other places around the country. I, yep. I, I know that there are parts of California that have done that have done that as well. So there are some models out there that you could um, look into if you haven't already. I, I would love to see that. I know that our health director is, is amenable to discussing it. So um, I'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Ms. Brisman. Thank you, Mr. Dorsey. Thank you, Ms. Williams, uh, Taylor Williams. 
for your insights. Uh, and and yes, that that uh, PowerPoint presentation is is duly slated for my Facebook page later today. So so let's make sure <laughs> that we get that link. And I was sharing that with uh, my colleague, Mr. Harrison, who I know uh, as as part of our uh, new council member contingent is feverishly working on similar legislation with regard to the declaration of racism and 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 in relationship to 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 the core mobilities and all of the things that we're learning about COVID uh, to move forward in our council, so that we could be a resource for you. Thank you again, Ms. Williams, uh, and and for that, we appreciate you. We hope to see you back. And 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 you can tell tell your national group that study in this region will teach everybody about what they need to do everywhere. This this region has that level of diversity. <laughs> I have my marching orders. Thank you. And I'm an I'm a DC native, so I take that to heart. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Take so, good care, everyone. You as well. Let me move on to agenda item number nine. And, and now we'll have our racial equity exchange. Uh, we will hear from elected officials and equity officers from Montgomery County and the city of Alexandria about how they have addressed racial equity from concept to implementation. We will first go to Montgomery County and then Alexandria. After we hear from both, I will facilitate question and discussion. Uh, I have a couple of people lined up that, that um, have um, uh, represented that they wanted to share. Uh, and I know that this uh, conversation probably could go on incessantly, so please bear with me as we try to uh, confine it in the time that we've allotted, but please do not be afraid to share. And so with that, let me turn uh, first to my colleague from Montgomery County, uh, Ms. Navarro. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and apologize in advance if for some reason my technology has issues, I'm having issues with my internet since my adult, uh, young adult daughters are also working from home. Uh, so thank you so much for this opportunity to present what we've done in Montgomery County. Um, I will say up front that um, what I'm going to share with you is a very short uh, PowerPoint presentation in terms of the process that we went through uh, in order to reach um, our Racial Equity and Social Justice Act, passage of that act. Um, but also wanted to start by saying that a lot of what has just been shared uh, is very timely for us as we yes. have already adopted, for example, the declaring racism a public health um, crises. Um, we've done things like pass the Crown Act uh, and uh, we have taken up and passed a slew of special appropriations uh, addressing specifically a lot of these disparities. Nonetheless, I will share with you that, you know, the latest data that we just, uh, council members have just received regarding positivity uh, case rates for uh, 100,000 uh, has shown that uh, in our case, uh, the Latino community, the Latin American uh, community has increasingly, um, those numbers have in, uh, increased um, steadily in the past three months while all others have been going down. So we have a lot of work to do still. Uh, and I think this is why this work is so important. And I'm so proud that Council of Governments, that we are coming together to dedicate this meeting to this issue. So let me this graphic that many of you, of course, have seen before, and I think it's very uh, also uh, timely because for a very long time, I think there's been kind of like an evolution in how we talk about this issue of disparities and barriers. And the truth of the matter is, that yes, for a long time, people talked about equality. Obviously, this is not what we're looking for. We kind of moved to equity, and many of us have worked on these uh, issues. It's the reason why I ran for office in the first place. I think we can all agree, especially in light of the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, protest and the uh, murders that we have seen and the coming together uh, of these twin pandemics, that what we're looking for is liberation. That is our goal. Our goal is that everybody uh, in this country and around the world has absolutely no barriers that has the same access to opportunities. And that is a bit, very big, big task, um, but we got to start and we have to commit, as, especially as uh, leaders. Next slide, please. So um, let me say that this is what prompted me to lead this work. Um, I uh, worked very closely with uh, who is uh, our county executive, Mark Elridge, when he was on the council, worked together, and really all my former colleagues and current colleagues. But for me, it was framing this issue as a socioeconomic imperative of our time. This is before COVID-19, of course. And so looking at the growth of population in Montgomery County, 
both in numbers and in diversity, knowing that this didn't happen overnight, right? It's not as if these are niche groups. Um, we are who we are. This is something that has been happening for decades. Um, we've worked so hard to try to eliminate these disparities. We have invested a lot of money trying to uh, 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 you know, eliminate these disparities, but they're persistent. We know that the disparities are institutional and systemic in nature, and therefore it was my view that we needed to put in place structural changes. Um, and addressing these issues of racial equity obviously is a must, uh, and we have to ensure that continued socioeconomic vitality of our county, they're tied together, right? What affects one community affects the totality of the quality of life in our jurisdictions. Now, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic and the Black Lives Matter protests have come together to shine a spotlight on the systemic health, social, economic, law enforcement, and many other institutional inequities in our country and also in our jurisdictions. Next slide, please. This is just to illustrate the demographic shifts in Montgomery County. If you look at 1980 to 2017, you see that our um, growth in terms of our diverse uh, communities has been quite exponential. And for that, I always say we are a microcosm of the country and the world. Um, but you can see right there that uh, it's it's really an incredible uh, growth. And um, you can also see that although some people sometimes might say that, hey, when you have a jurisdiction where there's a lot of diversity, somehow that affects quality of life, that hasn't been the case in our county. Actually, this is proof that our diversity is what contributes to the strength and the quality of life in our jurisdictions. Next slide. When you look at the school system, um, and I often say that the school system is kind of like, you know, uh, the epicenter of the change that you will see in your communities, you see also the changes in our population. Specifically, you look at the changes in terms of the um, growth of our um, Latinx students. It's 104.8% uh, change between 2002 and 2018. Right now, the largest group of students um, are Latin American uh, students. Next slide. So what um, happened then was that in April of 2018, um, we introduced a resolution affirming our commitment as a council to create an equity policy framework for Montgomery County. And um, then I started doing a lot of research, including uh, visiting with folks in King County uh, in the state of Washington to learn from their experience. Obviously they're a bit ahead of what we had done um, and then put forth a uh, action plan. Uh, and so on September uh, 2018, our Office of Legislative Oversight published a report, Racial Equity and Government Decision Making Lessons from the Field, so we would know what was happening. Um, and then uh, January 2019, as I began my presidency, um, we decided to come together to uh, the top leadership of the county, and we went through a training um, on uh, both uh, Latino challenges towards racial justice, um, which took place towards the end of the year, but also looking at the history and really, truly the structural, um, you know, um, institutionalized, uh, you know, positions that have led us to this moment. Uh, and that is really important. Um, we spent in total um, four days, the entire county leadership, examining these issues very closely. So that was one component. Then on March uh, 13th, as you can see of last year, we had our press conference where we announced that we're going to engage in this work and our first community conversation where we had over 500 participants, um, which was um, really incredible and, and really uh, representative of our uh, county population. In June um, uh, last year, then we had our baseline report um, and also uh, making sure that um, we would have a, something to compare ourselves to as we began the actual work. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you. And then from the spring to fall of last year, we continued to have these community conversations. And we were guided by a bilingual community engagement toolkit uh, that we also developed because we understood that, you know, we were not going to be able to reach everybody, but also wanted to empower, um, you know, community organizations or faith institutions, et cetera, uh, HOAs, you know, anyone to have that conversation. So we developed this toolkit, but we ended up having over a thousand participants in our uh, county sponsored community conversations, including a really wonderful youth town hall. So in October of last year, we uh, formally introduced the Racial Equity and Social Justice Act, Bill 27-19, and we held our committee hearings. Uh, this came to my committee 
um, where we had a session in November and we passed the bill on November 26, which was signed into law on December 5th. Um, the bill specifically calls for a few very important uh, issues. It calls for the creation of an uh, equity office, which is led by Ms. Tiffany Ward, who you will hear from. We did appoint her in February of this year. Um, also, uh, the bill calls for an equity impact note. So every time we adopt a bill, we need to have an equity, uh, racial equity and social justice impact note. Why? Because we need to see that data. We need to see trends. We need to make decisions based on data that can inform whether we are exacerbating or whether we're working towards the elimination of these disparities. So it's structural in nature. Also, when it comes to adopting budgets, every budgetary decision has to have an analysis about how this uh, budgetary decision strategically helps us move the needle. You know, does it exacerbate or does it help? And, and that to me was important because as a elected official, as a policymaker, you know, many times you will have particular policymakers who are very interested in these issues and they will bring these issues up and they will work on them. Um, you know, we can't rely on that because our composition of the council obviously changes. And so it is important to recognize that if a lot, if these disparities have been uh, put in place through structural decisions, through laws in the past, then we have to begin to dismantle this structurally with the opposite. So that is why for me it was so important that this would be number one legislation. Um, and look, of course, this is not the end all be all. <laughs> this is an important tool though, because it begins to codify this work in a much more systemic way. The other thing that the bill does is that it, it also calls for action plans by each department as well as a county, um, you know, for the administration to put forth an action plan. Um, and it also calls for our, our park and planning to abide by these, um, you know, by this law as well, by these principles. And it asks the school system and our colleges to do the same. We can't demand that they do it. We can't mandate it, but we're asking them so we can be aligned, um, obviously, so that we can have the best possible income uh, outcomes. Next slide. Uh, and this is right here. It just basically uh, describes what I just um, said. It also requires training for all county employees. That's um, super important. Uh, but here you can see uh, the different um, requirements of the law. Next slide. Um, another important component of the law is that it establishes a racial equity and social justice committee. Uh, these are eight public um, members from the public and seven members representing county departments. Um, a wonderful uh, piece uh, you know, that was a feedback from the community was that they wanted us to include stipends, recognizing that we wanted broad diversity, social economic diversity as well. Uh, and so we did adopt a $2,000 um, annual stipend for each of the eight public members of the committee to ensure that um, that we didn't have barriers with transportation or childcare and things like that. Um, and as you see here, uh, also requires us to sufficiently fund um, this act. Um, I will say that it was really amazing because it took King County 10 years to adopt this law. A lot of it had to do with changes in leadership. And so sometimes the political will wasn't necessarily there. Um, you know, it took us over a year to do this, but it's because the stars just aligned. I mean, there was just such commitment from everyone to work on this and to begin this very deliberative structural work. Now, none of us had a crystal ball. I had no idea that, you know, 2020 would be this fundamentally extraordinarily transformative year when it came to focusing on racial equity and social justice. Um, so in some ways, I'm so grateful that we had the vision of working on this um, in a deliberative fashion and that now we can really put, you know, roll up our sleeves to make sure that this uh, act is implemented at fidelity and that we can hold ourselves accountable for um, the results, which is so critical. And so everything that we're doing now, you know, whether it's you know, a bill we just introduced regarding use of force by our police department, whether, you know, we're talking about uh, our public health disparities, you know, everything really, <laughs> it's under this umbrella, um, which is, I think, a really important way for public officials, for policymakers um, to, to um, you know, to lead. Because as I said before, I think we were kind of relying on the goodwill and the commitment of whoever was elected to these seats. 
Um, I feel like this approach has the potential of obviously changing things. I will say also that New York State has introduced this same exact um, bill uh, and, uh, at, the, you know, at the state level, um, which you know, I'm very great. I'm really excited and proud that they have taken this on and taken literally our, our uh, bill and introduced it as well. And I think it can serve as a model. Um, obviously, you can always you know, enhance it, but I, I think that um, I'm pretty pleased with what we've been able to do. I do want to acknowledge that uh, Mayor Kate Stewart, Tacoma Park, they have been doing a lot of this work for a long time. So we've been really fortunate that in our county, um, this work has taken place for quite a bit. And there's been such extraordinary commitment um, and obviously, we would not have been able to do this unless we had this very active collaboration between the county council and the executive. And that's why I said earlier that the stars had aligned in terms of the political um, you know, uh, will to do this. Um, I think, let me see if there's another slide. <laughs> I think that's the, okay, so this is just uh, more information and also the link to access the toolkits. Um, they're in English and Spanish. Um, and again, it's a really nicely uh, put together toolkit that anybody can utilize and it guides you through these conversations as well. And thank you so much. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. So uh, colleague Navarro, do you want to introduce us to Ms. Ward? And then we'll, we'll let Ms. Ward also add a bit uh, to, to the discussion before we take Q&A. Absolutely. So Ms. Ward um, is somebody that, uh, of course, we are very proud to have appointed as the uh, chief equity officer. She is someone who is not a stranger to these issues, uh, as she uh, actually served in um, then council member Elrich's uh, team when he was on the council. But then she uh, really had a big, big, uh, I think, played a big role in the development of this process along with Dr. Elaine Bonner Tompkins. And so now uh, we're very lucky that she's officially in this uh, role and um, she's been doing a really amazing job at getting everything off the ground. So with further ado, Ms. Tiffany Ward. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I actually won't say too much. Nancy has really wrapped up how we got to the point where we are today. It was probably a year long day. Uh, and then um, February 25th, I was charged with implementing uh, no call for. Uh, about two, three weeks li later, COVID hit. So I think it was further proof that uh, the implementation of this bill was um, was absolutely necessary. So I'll just talk a little bit about where we are in implementing. So the bill, um, as you heard from Nancy, calls for us to train all of our employees in racial equity and social justice tenants. And so right now we are in the process of, uh, it also asks us to do, for every department to have a racial equity lead that quote, collaborates with the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice. So right now we're in the process of getting those leads set up, of setting up training, which will be a three-part kind of training uh, or curriculum, uh, working with GARE, working with other partners um, at the Racial Equity Institute, and uh, perhaps with our school system who does, we'll do some of our study circles work in helping our teams, uh, what we call normalizing conversations around race, right? And I'm sure um, Jacqueline will talk a little bit of, more about that. We have, um, we're actually just about to seat our, our racial equity and social justice committee. Really excited to have that, um, to have that group put, put together. They'll work with our uh, residents in doing uh, events and uh, other educational um, work around racial equity. Uh, we are also working um, to do our regs, uh, which really lays out the plan for the whole county on how this work will be implemented. Um, so we are in the midst of doing all of this in our last, in our, just the past four months, um, uh, much work to do. Uh, there's been, I think with the murder of George Floyd, with our COVID emergency, an incredible appetite, uh, around the county and around the region, um, for voices like mine and like the, uh, other chief equity officers in the region. And just conveying conversations about why this is so important and what people can do. And so I want to implore folks to, to think about, yes, what you can do, but first, what you can learn. I think so much of what's going on, um, in this particular in our employee populations, everybody wants to go. And that's, I really am appreciative of that. Uh, but I really want us to stop and think um, and, and really get um, a knowledge base for the history of this country 
and how policies have set us up to be where we are today. So we can have a really informed way of dismantling those policies and dismantling those practices. Um, so yeah, that was that's how I would implore people to kind of go about this work. We are in the very beginnings of our implementation stage, um, but I think it's going well. I'm excited to continue this work and excited to work with the council uh, and with County Executive Elrich uh, as we bring on more resources to support the work and support uh, what are, what the outcomes that we want for this work are. Okay. Thank you so much for that, uh, Ms. Nav uh, Nancy and Tiffany, appreciate you. Uh, let me not stop to facilitate questions here, but let me jump to uh, the city of Alexandria and grab um, Mayor Wilson and Ms. Tucker uh, so that we can, can try to make it through this process. I think we're at about 12, at about 1.13. The goal would be to, to try to close this out about 1.30. So let me stop talking and turn it over to Mayor Wilson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, and uh, thank you so much uh, to COG for having this uh, this focus today. You know, in many ways, this is uh, very much building on the work um, we did last year around housing, if not really a necessary prerequisite uh, for some of that work. And so uh, I think it's very appropriate that the council member Navarro, who we uh, were work, worked together on that housing work last year, um, would uh, would lead us in on this uh, on this racial equity work. Um, I'm going to give you a quick overview of some of the work we've been doing in Alexandria, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Ms. Jacqueline Tucker, who is our new race and uh, social equity officer. I believe she started. Uh, it looks like uh, two weeks prior to Montgomery County's uh, race and social equity officer. So uh, so we're going to take credit for beating them to that for uh, by a couple of weeks. Um, you know, in in many ways, 2020 has um, has shown some some very appropriate uh, bookends. On this conversation for us, you know, we began the year in Alexandria purchasing uh, Freedom House, which was um, owned by the Northern Virginia Urban League and was one of was the headquarters of one of the largest domestic slave trading operations in the United States. And uh, we have now brought that into the city's historic um, uh, properties uh, inventory and intend to, in partnership with the state, expanding that museum uh, to better tell that story. And then um, over the last several months, we have been dealing uh, with COVID, which, as Ms. Williams talked about earlier, has really shined a light and, and laid plain the incredible health disparities um, that we have in our community. And obviously in Alexandria, um, health disparities are, are not the only place um, that we see uh, the uh, really the echo of that uh, that um, that ingrained uh, white supremacy that was uh, in, in, indoctrinated in our uh, in our founding, in our country's founding, um, uh, and that's the story we're telling at Freedom House. Uh, but we see it today in health disparities, we see it in housing disparities, we see it in wealth attainment, we see it in criminal justice, um, and we see it in educational disparities. And so, uh, just like our friends in Montgomery County, this is not a new uh, conversation for us in uh, in Alexandria. Although certainly taking on uh, uh, a greater urgency over these last several uh, weeks and months, you know, three years ago we created an interagency uh, work group uh, to uh, to address uh, racial equity and make our work uh, more intentional and make ourselves uh, more accountable. Um, initially, in that work, we focused on. Uh, four areas of our government, our Department of Community and Human Services, uh, which is uh, where we see uh, direct uh, uh, community and human services on, on a regular basis, uh, health included, um, our human rights uh, department, our police department, and then our court services unit, which is our juvenile uh, correctional uh, probation uh, system. Um, in the police department, we have been uh, working with new intensity over the last several weeks um, to enhance uh, civilian oversight, and that was part of the resolution uh, that you included. I think one of the lessons we have uh, seen, and I think we will continue to, uh, to accentuate, is the need for partnerships. Um, this is not just something that has to happen in city government. This is work that we are doing in partnership with our schools. Um, we have a convening partner in our community foundation, an organization called Act for Alexandria. Um, and we have tried to ingrain um, this uh, focus and this accountability in everything that we do. Most recently, actually prior to, uh, to COVID, we have been engaged in a, a community health improvement effort. Um, which was looking very closely at racial equity and racial disparities and how we eliminate those disparities um, in our community. And so as we have uh, taken on the fight on COVID, um, we are able to use the data that identified uh, the disparities around hypertension, the disparities around obesity, the disparities around access to healthcare um, and, uh, and lung disease that, um, that we knew um, as part of our community health uh, planning effort. Um, we have done the same thing around our community and youth um, uh, master plan. 
um, effort, which also talked about the disparities in access to early childhood education and, and some of the, uh, the educational uh, dis uh, uh, inequities that we see today. And so um, our school board just recently enacted an equity plan uh, on, uh, for their organization, very much focused on, uh, on ameliorating these challenges. So I think we recognize we have a lot of work to do, and I think um, uh, making sure that we apply that racial uh, equity lens to the decisions that we are making is, uh, is job one for us as we move forward. Um, at this point, I want to turn it over to uh, to Ms. Jacqueline Tucker, who we are very excited uh, to bring on board um, at just the right time in uh, in February uh, uh, as our new uh, racial and equity, uh, social equity officer. And uh, I believe she has the item after this as well. So uh, she can talk a little bit about uh, the work she's doing in Alexandria and, and the work ahead of her, but then also the work she's been doing on the regional level to uh, to convene all the racial and social equity officers. So uh, I'm excited. Sorry. to her. So thanks, um, Mayor Wilson. Let me turn to Ms. Tucker. And what we'll do with Ms. Tucker, we'll, we'll stay stay local first, Ms. Tucker. And then um, what we'll do is grab grab a couple other uh, comments and then try to take a couple of questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Mayor Wilson. Uh, much of what he said is really an, a testament to a lot of the organizing work that has uh, preceding me and my arrival, arrival in the city of Alexandria um, in early February. Um, and I think that that organizing is critically important for cities and jurisdictions to really understand the disparities that they're facing around uh, race and social equity um, and having that foundation. Um, to date, we have not uh, really codified our racial equity efforts uh, with a formal resolution. That is something that I think uh, involves quite a bit of community input and effort to really make sure that their voices are being heard. Um, and it was something that was on my radar to do very early in my tenure uh, with the city, but with the onset of COVID and the social unrest that we have been dealing with uh, within my first 90 days on the job, um, it's not something that um, uh, has been a priority. Um, so it's something that we're looking to do in the fall and really to codify what it means to do race and social equity work. Um, and to have community input and in what that means for us to do as a city. Um, I think the best framework, and I'll talk about this uh, a little bit later, is similar to what uh, Tiffany and Montgomery County have said and the work that they have that done is to really, how do you embed uh, systemic uh, responses to racism within your policies and your practices and procedures and your budget decisions? Um, as a city, we work a little bit differently than the county of Montgomery, uh, Montgomery County. So, uh, our processes in, in doing that and embedding that will be a little bit different. But our goal is still to normalize, operationalize, and organize. And normalizing is really how do we set a, a shared foundation around uh, race and social equity? How do we have a shared vocabulary within the city government, but also within the community? Uh, what that means so that people are approaching it from historical context. And I think what we're seeing now is that people. Um, our understanding that our, our current and present situation um, are not happening in, happening in isolation. This is very much rooted in our historical roots as a country, and we have to address that in our cities and our jurisdictions. Um, and then operationalizing, how do we use a racial equity tool um, to really um, interrupt the biases um, that we see playing out in our, in our execution of the policies for our residents and our citizens? Uh, we've had the opportunity to do that uh, with our COVID-19 response and with our COVID-19 um, kind of reopening efforts uh, is to use a racial equity tool and really to center people of color in that response to make sure that uh, we're doing that equity, equitably because as our previous guest said, um, COVID-19 is disproportionately impacting people of color and in the city of Alexandria, our Latinx population um, is experiencing uh, that the worst. Um, and then how do we have this organizing? Um, like Mayor Wilson said, we have a lot of uh, internal organizing. There was an interpart interdepartmental working group that preceded me uh, for about three years. And really they started the conversation about racial equity um, and created a path forward for me to be able to uh, be uh, in this role as a race and social equity officer. But how, how do we also use the moment, uh, the community's heightened interest and urgency in racial equity um, to really have an organizing effort outside of uh, the city uh, employee body and to really hold city accountable to our efforts in trying to advance racial equity as a city. Um, so there's an internal and external organizing that has to take place. I think government for me, and I hope for all of you, is really how do we serve people 
Um, and we kind of get lost in that when we start to really focus on the transactional nature of what we do behind the scenes. Um, and really, to me, racial equity is how do we bring humanity and how do we bring people back into government and really hear their voices and really serve people um, the best that we can do. Um, so uh, we have lots of work to do in the city of Alexandria, but I am confident and I feel uh, very supported by Mayor Wilson as well as the city manager. Um, and they're prioritizing race and social equity to really make us uh, a, better, a better city and for all Alexandrians to really benefit uh, from the prosperity that we all kind of experience in this particular region. Uh, but we know that still certain populations are being left behind, and so we want to address that head on. So thank you so much. Um, that's so important. Uh, what I want to do because uh, I know I, I, I'm, I'm compelled to talk, so I know I must be quiet and so that my colleagues can have an opportunity to ask questions. And while colleagues are lining up for questions, let me turn uh, first to Prince William County uh, Supervisor uh, Andrea Bailey, just for just a brief comment and uh, uh, with regard to the specifics of this issue. Ms. Bailey, let me take you now. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, uh, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to... Um, just applaud, excuse me, all of the presentations that we've had thus far uh, in, in reference to moving forward and addressing this most pressing issue. Um, I wanted to share also that uh, Prince William County has taken um, the, the, the fortitude and the, and the, the importance in moving forward and, and creating a resolution, if you will, for our county uh, just to develop equity and inclusion, a framework with policy to uh, in considering equity as it relates to COVID-19 and the COVID-19 recovery plan and the development for strategic plan going forward. So I wanted to share that and um, I, I've sent an, an example uh, of the page that we've created. This was done on June 16th in our board meeting uh, just to stamp with the stamp of approval uh, of, of the board saying that this is an imperative uh, plight that we have. And, and Ben, I, I, you, of course you can read, I don't wanna read it all to you, but I wanna go down to um, the bottom portion that says now therefore be it resolved that Prince William County, uh, the Prince William County supervisors hereby direct staff to develop a framework for becoming a more inclusive and equitable Prince William County that includes the development of equitable lens, lenses and tools to assess our programs, planning and processes that will reflect the importance of equity and inclusion in Prince William County and uh, be it sur uh, further resolved that the Prince William County Supervisors uh, hereby directs that the that equity be considered the development of the COVID-19 pandemic recovery plan as it applies to the 2021-24 um, strategic planning process and all future reviews of the county planning processes. So this is a, a, a uh, way forward. Um, we need uh, assistance in, in making sure that we are addressing equity in all lenses with the tools like we've been presented today to make sure that we are moving forward with, with an avenue that is so imperative. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I appreciate the opportunity to let you know that we are partnering with COG as well as uh, the other organizations, GAR, to make sure that we are in concert in moving this region forward as it applies to equity and inclusion. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Supervisor Bailey, appreciate that. Um, and let me turn to Mayor Stewart from Tacoma Park uh, just to share her experience as well briefly. Thank you, thank you very much, Chair. Um, and I just wanna say thank you to um, all my colleagues who have shared today and the great presentations that we've had. Um, I just want to underscore a couple of things that have been our experience in Tacoma Park. Um, we passed a resolution um, uh, in 2017 um, after the city council decided that a racial equity framework um, was going to be one of our uh, core priorities um, moving forward. And the first step we took, um, similar to as um, Councilman Navarro talked about at the county level, was to um, look at putting a racial um, impact and consideration statement on all our agenda items so that um, the uh, issue of racial equity was front and center every time we took up an item uh, in our meeting. Um, and as Ms. Tucker talked about, the need to really normalize 
um, these conversations and be talking about and naming race and the racial disparities that occur in our communities is so important. Um, as well as making sure that we have a um, shared language and definitions. Um, you know, this this work is not easy. Um, the conversations that we need to be having um, at our council meetings with our staff and in our communities um, are not easy ones. Um, and having a shared language is very important. And as we saw from uh, Councilman Navarro's um, example of the of the graphic that we've all come to um, know over the years working on these issues, um, you know, it, it, that continually gets updated as we look at what really is our goal in the work that we're doing. Um, so normalizing these conversations is something that we've been working on and, and every day realize the importance of it. And that leads to the next important piece, which is the training, the training for our staff, um, for uh, members of our public to really listen to each other and figure out how we're actually going to operationalize um, the racial equity work. Um, another just another lesson learned, I would say, from us in Tacoma Park as we've been doing this work over the last couple of years, in addition to really naming race and keeping it front and center in the work, is really digging deep and understanding the difference between intent and impact. You may all have, uh, we may have great intentions and the policies and programs we put in place, we may intend for them to work in a certain way, but we really need to understand how they're actually put in place and the impact that they have in our communities. Um, you know, even just looking at things like um, complaint based systems that we have or um, who, who gets a sidewalk in our community um, and other things we've put in place systems with good intentions, but the impacts um, many times have been to increase inequities. Um, and so as leaders, we need to acknowledge um, no matter what our intent has been that we need to own and um, really work on the impact. Um, and then finally, um, one of the things that um, we also try and keep front and center for many of our residents is the fact that our goal is working toward a day where race no longer predicts one's success. And that working towards that goal will improve outcomes for our entire community. Because um, this is something that will, you know, work and help for the quality of life for everyone who lives in our community when we can say that race no longer predicts Six, uh, one success. So thank you very much. And I just want to thank my colleagues again. And it is really uh, an honor to work in Montgomery County with Councilman Navarro. And uh, we're so excited that Tiffany is on board. Thank you. Thank you. Let me let me first thank my colleagues uh, across the board from uh, Prince William up to Montgomery County. And I'm reminded that the city of Frederick uh, is at the this point considering their resolution on July the 16th. So, so uh, you know, I only tongue in cheek said to Ms. Uh, Williams earlier that study of this region is probably a study of a microcosm of what the macro uh, United States is. And, and I'm, I'm reminded um, that, you know, we were uh, in, in the country's beginning, I, I got a chance to watch Hamilton the other day. We were a slave state. And, and, and I'm often reminded that Prince George's County is one of the most unique jurisdictions in the country uh, and it sits in the state of Maryland and we are a majority minority jurisdiction. Um, you know, we, we've talked at COG about many things and we, we thought we would get off to a, a fairly good start this year looking at both land use and housing. Um, I'm reminded that both of those things in Prince George's County had structural racism embedded throughout them. And those were reasons that we sought to change both our zoning code as well as create a more comprehensive housing strategy that took into consideration some of the things that we needed to do. Uh, if it's not for COVID-19, I don't know that we're focusing on comorbidities that come with uh, structural racism as we've talked about today. And if it wasn't for George Floyd, I don't know that we're having a serious conversation about police reform and what it means to our um, our black and brown people across this country. Um, but we're doing it now. And this region, uh, I'm proud to be a part of a region who is ready to respond, not just with lip service, but with 
all of their efforts to codify realities. And that's and that's what it's all about. And, and, and I'm I'm just a proud moment uh, for me that that I just wanted to say thank you to all my regional colleagues of uh, uh, right now with regard to this discussion that we're having about racial equity. So for those you don't know, uh, Miss Ward and Miss Tucker uh, were featured panelists at Cog's virtual race equity and the future of Greater Washington Regional Summit last month. For anyone who could not participate at the time, a video link is available on the homepage of COG's website. Chuck, that will be set up for my Facebook page immediately. So I look forward and colleagues, please follow suit because this is an important discussion that uh, needs to continue on far beyond the pandemic and far beyond and, and, and become embedded in the psychology of how we do everything that we do. Uh, let me keep moving because now I'm only 13 minutes off schedule. Uh, let's try to see what we can do here in, in item number 10. And I apologize to colleagues. I didn't see questions on the chat room. And so we won't take any further questions with regard to that, but I ask you that you continue this dialogue and this important dialogue in your communities and through legislation. Our next item covers the regional racial equity cohort, a COG initiative to bring local government staff members together to address racial equity at the regional level and help develop new policies and new practices. Staying with us for this item is Ms. Jacqueline Tucker, the City of Alexandria's Race Social Equity Officer, who is doing double duty today. <laughs> My best to, to, to be able to separate it so that you can uh, also shine the spot on this very important topic. Ms. Tucker, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so prior to coming to the city of Alexandria, I was the East Region Project Manager with the Government Alliance on Race and Equity uh, and played an instrumental part in getting this cohort started. Uh, if you can go to the next uh, uh, slide, Jenny. Um, really the cohort um, was kind of created by the Racial Equity Working Group within COG that I believe came out of a training that Julie Nelson and I did. Um, it was in March of 2007, 2018. Um, and since then, uh, we've had the kind of design and kind of creation of the cohort uh, for the jurisdictions who are a part of COG that really were interested in doing racial equity um, to their credit before any of the current urgency that we're experiencing. Um, and many people were at, in many jurisdictions were at different levels um, in their journey. Um, some had, you know, uh, like Tacoma Park were members of here already and Fairfax were members of here. And some people were just having the, their very first discussion around race and social equity um, and what that means for our government. Uh, and that is their primary role um, as a membership organization is to work with local and regional government um, to work specifically on racial equity in their policies and their practices. So the cohort um, is a 10 month learning series um we cover everything from government's role in racial equity uh, how to use a racial equity tool communicating on, on race uh, and racism creating a racial equity action plan and the way that this cohort when well, you'll see that there were 11 jurisdictions in uh, the dc maryland and virginia area um, in our initial cohort and um the way that this cohort was designed uh and you can go to the next slide uh jenny um, is that the chairs of the Racial Equity Working Group really wanted to focus on regionally specific items uh, of policy. Um, and so this is different from the other GEAR cohorts that exist across the country um, because they just kind of focus on the 10 kind of key um, tools that can be used to cover racial equity. In this particular cohort, we had uh, what we call deeper dive sessions. Uh, and they were voted on by the Racial Equity Working Group and they were public safety and court services, community development and planning, uh, transportation and mobility and governing uh, for equity, which is really covers the business functions of government and how you can uh, embed equity there. Um, so these were topics that uh, we thought as a region could help move the region forward if we had a racial equity focus and additional kind of learning around those topic areas. Uh, again, the goal of the cohort is to really get government in the door, but also for you to have learning opportunities with your peers in the region. 
um, in hopes that at some point there could be a policy agenda that can be put forth immediately. Uh, GEAR uses the normalized, operationalized, and organized framework, which I mentioned before, um, and really normalizing conversations, operationalizing, using tools and the policies and, and the culture, and then organizing, having that internal uh, infrastructure to support this work, um, but also the external support. Um, so the goal of the program uh, is to have each jurisdiction have a pilot project um, and to think through something that they can work through in their jurisdiction that really has an equity lens of emphasis as sort of kind of practice uh, to be implemented um, before you can kind of do this work on a large scale. Um, and so we started in September 2019, we met in person for six sessions, and then February was our last session, and February was our initial conversation about racial equity action plans. We weren't scheduled to end until June. Um, as you know, from you know February to now, we have not been able to meet in person. So that has really significantly uh, challenged this particular cohort and what we can do um, seeing the execution and implement implementation all the way through because um, every jurisdiction's focus has shifted up substantially um, from what they were previously doing. Um, so we've continued to have kind of two hour sessions throughout this time. Uh, trying to do support around COVID-19 and really kind of re-emphasizing the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 and the other issues that we're currently facing uh, across the country and within our jurisdictions. Um, and so the goal is, I think the cohort will officially wrap up um, at the end of this month, um, and then there will be an implementation cohort, uh, which will be for either all members or some of the members from this initial cohort to participate and kind of think through the implementation of their racial equity action plan and get more support from here um, in doing that. Uh, we'll also launch a, a, another introductory cohort for all new members. Um, and that structure is still being designed between Pog and Deer. Uh, but it'll be another 10 month learning cycle for additional members of jurisdictions uh, employees to participate in this learning um, and build capacity for uh, and to support those who are a part of that initial cohort. Um, so really, this is a, a learning opportunity to learn with your peers and to learn uh, with other jurisdictions about racial equity and to really uh, work through the challenges of having this conversation. I think uh, one of the major benefits is that we're able to do this together. And I think having those initial 11 jurisdictions kind of gave some people cover because um, the progress that has been made in the number of chief equity officers positions that are being created as we speak uh, really speaks to uh, jurisdictions kind of now understanding the, the value and the importance of having individuals who are able to center and hold this work going forward and able to do some of the codifying that we talked about earlier. Um, so I'll stop there. I know we're behind. Thank you so much, Ms. Tucker. <laughs> Double <laughs> duty. Uh, appreciate you thoroughly. Just checking the floor first for questions uh, from colleagues um, in the chat box. I didn't see any. Chuck, am I correct? You're correct. So let me check to see if there are colleagues from um, board members from Maryland who have questions. Let me check to see if there are board members from Virginia who might have questions. Good to go. And board members from the District of Columbia, any questions? Colleagues heard my plea. Uh, with regard to time, Chuck, it sounds. So let me go on to item number 11. Uh, this is racial equity as a fundamental value. Now we come to our final item. Consideration of resolution 26-2020. This is bought before you uh, by the board, to, bought before the board today by the executive committee. You will see in the whereas clauses an acknowledgement that several COG members are incorporating equity as part of their deliberations, like the ones we've heard today and epitomized in one Fairfax. The Regional Forward Coalition as a part of COG has focused on equity in the past two years with an aspiration of equity woven into the region forward vision that has its fundamental pillars, prosperity, accessibility, 
livability, and sustainability. This was something that uh, the executive committee uh, discussed uh, over the last couple of weeks in light of all of the things that are, are going on around us in, in the country. Uh, and I think you heard pegs in, in, in the conversation uh, throughout today, uh, whether it be with regard to procurement, whether it be with regard to equity in policing, equity uh, and, and racial uh, biases that are pervasive in our cultures, uh, looking at what the you know the decimation of our populations in a passionate fashion with regard to COVID-19. Uh, we sought to weave into that in a very simple, succinct, but powerful way, uh, a message that COG as an organization could essentially uh, put forward as its fundamental uh, goal with regard to equity and racism. Um, let me turn to, to staff because I'm looking around for the statement and I don't have it uh, and I don't want to misspeak any of the words. So, so Chuck, is there someone who could read for us uh, R26? Uh, yes, I think uh, Jenny's able to put this onto the, the screen. screen. Can yeah. you bring up uh, R20, R26? And I just turn my notice in the, in the chat, uh, Mayor Stewart. There it is. We'll have an amendment after the resolution is proposed. So have, have board members had an opportunity to take a look at um, resolution 26? And let me see if my two co vice chairs uh, would like to make a motion and comments. Sure, Mr. Chairman, uh, I will move uh, adoption of R26-2020. Is there a second, Mr. White? A uh, second. Thank you, sir. So we got it on the floor. Um, so there's a motion and a second to adopt um, R26. Uh, the COG, that the COG uh, affirmed that our work together as the Metropolitan Council of Governments will advance racial equity and that racial equity is a fundamental value. Now, Chuck, I heard that there is a, an amendment uh, that we might want to offer. Yes, uh, Mayor Stewart is indicating in the chat box the addition of two wear whereas clauses. <clears throat> Mayor Stewart, would you like to proffer those amendments? Sure. And thank you very much. And first, I want to say thank you to the executive for bringing this um, before us and for all the work that went into it. Um, as I was listening to the um, presentations this afternoon and rereading the resolution, I'd like to offer that we add two whereas. I believe they go best after um, the. Fourth, whereas clause, um, I will read it in the chat box. Um, first, whereas clause says, whereas the board of directors recognizes the history of racism in our country and how it has led to the current day disparities in education and job attainment, housing and health care, as well as disproportionate, disproportionate incarceration rates for black and brown members of our communities. And whereas the Board of Directors recognizes that racial inequities have become institutionalized in the policies and practices of many agencies, governmental and otherwise. Yes. Um, and it would pick up again. I think um, the, uh, as we talked about and had from our um, excellent presentations today, the, na the, the need to name race, um, as Ms. Ward said, the need to make sure we're acknowledging that policies that we have set up today have you know in, continued um, racial disparities in our communities, um, and this would be a, a good addition to an already excellent resolution. Thank you, Mayor. Stewart. Will my co-chairs uh, accept those two clauses as friendly amendments to their their? Yeah, I, I say absolutely. I I I like really do like the increased focus on on government both. Uh, its role uh, in causing and uh, responsibility for for fixing uh, racial disparity. So uh, thank you, Mayor Stewart, for that. I, I strongly support it. Thank you. How about you, Mr. Dorsey? Thank you. A absolutely, Mayor Stewart. A thoughtfully, thoughtfully articulated, and I appreciate that as being friendly. And I will just note um, that it's not just the history of racism in our country that leads to present day disparities. It is the, as you recognize later in the second whereas clause, it is the uh, active uh, deployment of institutionalized racism 
that uh, persists and exacerbates them as well. So thank you. Absolutely. Um, I, I would I would thank Mayor Stewart uh, for, for being thoughtful, for, 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 for doing our homework and coming ready for the test to make sure that we don't just get an A, we get an A plus. Um, and so with that, Mr. Bean, are we fine from the perspective of adding that amendment on the fly? Um, Mr. Chairman, that's been added on this screen. I believe it's the fifth and sixth new whereas clause. That would be the Got amendment. It. Got it. So colleagues, is there, let me take a vote on the R, what is it now? R26 as amended, uh, all, are there any abstentions or nay votes? Hearing none. Oh, Mr. Chairman. We have Hi, one. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Identify yourself by name and jurisdiction. Sure. Dave Snyder, City of Falls Church. It's an honor to support this resolution. I would make the comment that how we do things and the way we do things and when we do things may differ depending on where we are in the continuum of achieving our uh, collective goal that we're stating well here. So thank you very much and we'll fully support of this resolution. Thank you. Thank you so much there, Mr. Snyder. I certainly appreciate that. And so I hear no nays, I hear no abstentions, I uh, have, have had brief comments. Uh, therefore, this motion passes and I thank all of my colleagues uh, for <clears throat> all of their efforts here at COG, uh, they're transformational. Doing at home uh, institutionally provides a fundamental uh, stone for the rest of the country to step upon. We're doing the work. Uh, we, we often talked about coopetition and collaboration and all of those things. We are down to brass tacks, fundamental changing society at this point. And, and, and again, I, I can't be prouder to, to serve, to facilitate these meetings with such a great team of people. So, so thank you very, very, very much. Um, let me move on to uh, item number 12 before I get teary-eyed. Uh, and that's other business. Uh, and let me check to see if there's any other business that we may need to take up, uh, Mr. Bean. No, sir, you've done a lot. All right, I, I pulled it off. Um, so let me, since I pulled it off and, and with a few minutes to spare, let me just see if there are colleagues uh, who might want to take about 30 seconds. I know I'm saying this, I'm probably going to get in trouble uh, to, to make just brief comments with regard to, to what they heard here today. Uh, and, and I'll just, I'll give, I'll give somebody from, from each jurisdiction, somebody from Virginia, an opportunity. And the first one with their hand up uh, gets, gets the chalice from Virginia. Anyone from Virginia with a comment? Supervisor President is asked to be recognized. Hi, um, thank you so much for recognizing uh, me. And, um, you know, I, in, in learning all this, I realized that Loudoun County is, you know, on the continuum and has not been able to do a lot of the work that we now hope to do. But I wanted to share, since the topic today is um, systemic racism, last night in Loudoun County, our board voted to return a Confederate monument to the United Daughters of the Confederacy. It was, uh, no pun intended, a monumental and very emotional moment on our board for the first African-American chairwoman in Virginia to be able to do that. Yeah. And I couldn't be more prouder to be involved. And I'm very much looking forward to emulating our friends um, in uh, Montgomery County and other jurisdictions that shared their process today. I put in our comments a Twitter page that has the motion given by Chair Randall and all our yay votes is something worth watching. And um, thank you for letting me share that. And thank you for all of your work and helping me get educated so that I am not just not a racist, but I can be an anti-racist. And I look forward to working more. Amen. Appreciate that. Let me break my own rule and turn to uh, the, 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 the wise counsel uh, from, from the other part of Virginia, Ms. Gross. I, I, know, I know my good friend Penny has something she'd like to say. Thank you. Um, I, I hope I'm on. You are. Now. Okay. Actually, this has been a fascinating conversation and I'm, I'm looking at it over decades of 
of experience and I'm not quite sure what to say. What I would like to, what I was going to ask is, this is such an important resolution. I would hope that we actually could have had a yay vote voice vote instead of just um, assuming that we weren't going, you know, that nobody was going to oppose. Uh, but I think we're, we're past that now. Um, I, I would hope that we can have some really um, uh, intense, actually, conversations between and among us on the COG board, because we all have such different experiences. Yes. And, and we need to be able to understand, you know, those experiences with each other. Derek, I know that you and I, when you were not at the dais, uh, up, up, up at, the, at the head uh, of the dais, and when we were just sitting next to each other during board meetings, we discovered there was so much that we had yes. in common in our, in our thought processes and so forth. We haven't been able to do that for a while because we've not been all together. But this is one of those times when I think it really would be helpful for us to have those lunch con lunchtime conversations. So I'm hoping that we can have a less formal um, a conversation between and among our members and, and maybe find some sort of times that are not board meetings to have those conversations because that really helps us in our um, in our legislation, quite frankly, to understand what's going on around the region with everybody else's experiences, which are sometimes very similar and sometimes enormous. Thank you, Thank you so much for that. Um, and sounds like a, a retreat inside a retreat once we beat back this COVID-19 thing uh, and that, that we all will be due for. Let me- Absolutely. Let me grab uh, Mr. Dorsey. Let me grab Ms. Bailey for 30 seconds and then close out with Mr. Dorsey from Virginia. And then I'll turn to Maryland. Uh, so, Ms. Bailey. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I just echo what my colleague, Ms. Gross, has said. I, as a new member of this board, I'm just blown away. I did not want to come and sit in a seat and take some notes and go back home and have lunch. And, and <laughs> you all have afforded me the opportunity to. Uh, be a part of something that is pinnacle and transforming and we are the ones for such a time as this so thank you so much for the opportunity to be in the presence of such great leaders thank you miss bailey mr dorsey close out virginia so oh, thank you so much mr chair i'll just say in addition to just being proud of everyone for the thoughts that bring us to this moment i'm actually inspired about the work that will come uh, because i think there are so many opportunities for us to take this from a transformative rhetorical moment to a real meaningful substantive moment throughout our jurisdictions as we create the types of changes that hopefully will lead our country um, in, in understanding how to go from, uh, as Ms. Navarro put it, uh, a history of thinking about it in terms of equality to a present where we're focused on equity, but to our ultimate outcome of liberation. So yeah. let's get to work, folks. Amen. Appreciate that, uh, Mr. Uh, Dorsey. Um, thank you for for quarterbacking. Uh, uh, and and I think I think I played running back, and Mr. White played fullback as we as we we went through this process. Um, Mr. Bean played center, hiked us the ball, and we went to work. Let me turn to Navarro in Montgomery, then to Ms. Stewart uh, from Tacoma Park. Ms. Navarro, thank you. So Mr. Chairman, I uh, just really want to express my appreciation to the COG board, to the COG staff for this extraordinary moment. Um, you know, on a personal note, um, the first Latina ever to be elected to Montgomery County Council, I'm an immigrant. I am married to a black man from the Caribbean who raised two extraordinary Latina daughters. And I chose this region for a reason. And today I think we have cemented why this region is so extraordinary. Uh, so now we get to work, but um, I'm just super inspired and so grateful uh, for this extraordinary moment. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Chair um, Davis. But I don't have anything else to add. I just wanted to say thank you for everything. <laughs> Mine was from before, so thank you. Chair Davis, you might be mute. Am I unmuted? Yes. So, so all that was was thank you to all of my colleagues from both Virginia and the state of Maryland. Just wanted to turn to to Good. the 
running back in the backfield, Mr. White, for one brief comment, and then we'll we'll close out. Can I make? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Who was that? Uh, Tim Adams. Okay. Okay. Mayor Adams. Good. Uh, there, two quick things that I want to say first, uh, as um, some of you may know, and and my eldest daughter um, passed away recently, very suddenly. Uh, I want to say thank you to, to all of you because I had several members of COG reach out to me. And I want you to know that that, that was very special and I do appreciate that on behalf of mm -hmm. me and my family. Uh, my daughter did leave a wonderful one-year-old. And so this mm -hmm. makes this even more special because what we did today is to trying to create a better life. That's right. For those who are coming behind, so that some of those conversations we have, those structural issues we have, when, when he turns 18, hopefully the work that we do and the emphasis that we put on that today will change that for his life. So I, I just want to say, uh, very proud to be a part of this and very proud of what we're doing today. And again, thank you to all of those who reached out. Uh, and I do appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Adams. Appreciate you as well. And we're very sorry, and, I, and your, your family's. Uh, let me see, Mr. White. Uh, thank you very much. And, and first of all, let me uh, express my sincere condolences uh, to the Mayor Adams for, for your loss. That's just an incredible loss. Um, I, I'm glad that you're here with us today, though, and, and also get to, to be a part of uh, what I think is an extraordinary moment. Now, for, for me, uh, as an African American, so for so many African Americans on this board, uh, when we recognize about this moment, you know, in the nation and here in COG, is that we've reached the point where we can have an honest dialogue uh, about racism and about uh, the disparities and difficulties of being Black in America and, and have a conversation and progress that many of us thought we never would, would see in our lifetime. Absolutely. We've reached this moment. We're really starting to wrap our arms around this movement and, and making a collective commitment to move forward, to be honest uh, about racism, about its impacts, and, and really to move uh, our governments forward. And so I really want to thank uh, Chuck and the COG team. Uh, I want to thank uh, 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 Mr. Davis, Chair Davis, uh, for their leadership on this. And, and this is just one of the many things that makes me honored to be a part of COG. And I want to thank all of my colleagues because so many people weighed in. Uh, Mayor Smith's yes. additions, I think, are incredible. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm proud of this. We got a lot of work in front of us, uh, but but this this is the direction. And uh, and so I just want to say thank you uh, to everyone who's worked on this. Thank you, team. Thank you, Mr. White. Um, and and we keep all in in our hearts and minds and in prayer. I want to thank you for for joining us today. And we stole that ten minutes back so that we could close this out appropriately. And I would suggest that all uh, I said tongue in. Here, this is going up on social media. Um, this is one of the things that I think you should share freely. Uh, we should share freely so that that the tone is set across the country uh, that we are a lot more alike than we are different. And those things that are different about us, we can celebrate and we can we can share and we can elevate. Um, I, I like uh, Montgomery County's focus on the end being liberation. Let's work towards that. And with that, I'll accept a motion for to let you know first that Wednesday, August. The 12th is our next meeting. Uh, staff will be in touch with you with details and logistics for that meeting. Is there a motion for adjournment? So moved, Mr. Chair. It has been moved and seconded. All who would prefer to say nay or abstain. Sounds like the eye oh. again. Hearts are <laughs> clear. We are adjourned. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.